Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak on your esteemed conference. It's the first time that I'm presenting here on the VisArt workshop. So it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And you asked me to present on a small project that is called the European Time Machine Project. And I want to show you a couple of the building blocks that we are working on towards building this, what we call a virtual time machine. My name is Andreas Meyer. I'm a professor in computer science of the Friedrich Alexander University in Nuremberg, Germany. And I'm also a board member of the Time Machine Organization. You can also find me on Twitter with my handle Meyer underscore AK. The continent, Europe. In archives, Beneath stones, in crumpled maps and winding streets, in pictures and paintings, in the depth of its green forests. History in Europe lies everywhere. How does one preserve and explore such a dense and fragmented past? How does one bring it into resonance with our contemporary world? So you can see that this European Time Machine project is a very ambitious project with the aim of digitizing more than 2,000 years of European history. You can see the different challenges in the project here. Imagine all the documents here in the State Archives of Venice. The State Archives alone have thousands of documents that would need to be digitized. And imagine all the information that would be available in these documents. Obviously, you need advanced scanning techniques. Here it's 80 kilometers of shelves of documents that would need to be digitized. And then you find not just books there, but they also have all kinds of other information. So you can find essentially 1,000 years of European history there. You can find maps, you can find cadaster entries, all kinds of documents and the digitization alone is a huge challenge. However, it's not just digitization, it's really big data of the past. In 2012, the Digital Humanities Lab at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne launched the Venice Time Machine and offered unique virtual immersion into history thanks to the development of big data and artificial intelligence technology. Since then, dozens of European cities have taken similar steps. Each now contributes to the creation of a unified temporal exploration tool accessible to all. All these initiatives are now gathered within a consortium that groups together more than 250 European partners universities, archives, research centers, and also private companies. Time Machine participants include historians, engineers, geographers, developers, entrepreneurs, researchers from a variety of backgrounds, as well as ordinary citizens, defenders of their heritage. If you look at the amount of information that is available in our history, you realize that most of the digital information is available at present day. The further you go back in time, the less digital information is there. Now, if you were to start to digitize everything, you would only get, let's say, halfway to your goals. So we believe that not just digitization, but also advanced AI, computer vision, and processing techniques are crucial in order to gain additional insights of our past. So simulation will be a key component to get a better understanding of our history. Chaque ville du réseau de la Time Machine pose des défis particuliers. Et donc chacune des équipes qui reconstruisent Paris, reconstruisent Budapest, reconstruisent Amsterdam, Morvaire, nous permettent de développer des compétences spécifiques. I believe that the time machine is the future, how we will do digital humanities and humanities in the future. What we are striving after is really building things that are used to gain new insights. If we had such information, we could create entirely new access to our past. So here we show a mock-up of 3D models of ancient Venice 
and cataster information where we can locate different businesses inside this 3D reconstruction of the world. You can see that this gives us a very good understanding of what has happened where in the city. Also note that the reconstruction is of course a huge challenge because we are not sure about the information of our past. So we somehow have to show that information is lacking and in this rendering we chose for example all the facades to be white grayish because we can't say for sure how they have been painted in the past and what information to show here exactly. Still you can see that this is an entirely new method of accessing the past and it gives us insights over relations of persons, businesses and historical information over the complete past of Venice. Now Venice is only one example. We have many different time machine initiatives that are emerging right now. You can see there's initiatives in Amsterdam, Antwerp, Budapest, in Dresden and many other European cities. So I want to highlight a couple of the research projects that are happening right now in the Nuremberg time machine and these are essentially contributions from our university and I'll just show a brief selection of different projects where I've been involved. First step, collect and aggregate data thanks to digital tools and automate everything in order to carry it out on a massive quasi-industrial scale. So we have all those data, we have to store that properly and manage it properly, but we also have to make sense of the data. If you just present to the people thousands of terabytes of data, it's meaningless. Today, science and technology can profoundly transform the cultural heritage with an impact on research, education, new applications, economy and society at large. We also looked into scanning and in particular if you want to mass scan or also want to access very fragile documents, a concept called book CT may come in very handy. So you see there's documents that get damaged and destroyed all the time. Sometimes they are so heavily mutilated that you can't open them anymore. Some of these documents just fall apart when you open them and you can see individual letters falling off the pages. So you would be interested in reading them without having to opening them. And my colleague Daniel Stromer, you can see him on the top left here, he exploited the fact that some of the historical inks, actually quite a few of them, contain metal particles. So here are two different inks, one is malachite, the other one is iron gall ink, and both of them contain metal particles. We even got a couple of samples and sent them to mass spectroscopy, so you can see which elements are actually present. And you see that there are quite a few iron particles in these kind of inks. Because we know that we can see metal particles really well in CT, we can use non-invasive scanning techniques like the scanner you see here on the left hand side. So this is a metronome scanner which has a field of view of approximately 20 centimeters and it can scan objects at a resolution of up to 20 microns. So you essentially place the book on a turntable and then take many x-ray projections and with these x-ray projections you are then able to reconstruct a 3D volume. Now you can already see the next problem. If you look at this 3D volume, it's reconstructed on a Cartesian grid, but the Cartesian grid essentially never coincides with the actual book pages, so you can't read the book, but you see different pages showing through at different positions. So you essentially need a segmentation algorithm. We were choosing a variant of the Wesselness filter here in order to detect the book pages. Once you did that, we can then extract the center line for each book page, then we virtually flatten it and with the flattened book page we can now compress it to a 2D image and if you do so you get actually quite good results. So in the top row you see photographs of the pages and the bottom row you see the extracted result from a CT scan. Note that this is a mock-up here right now this is not the result from a real historical document, but we are currently working towards really scanning historical documents.
Now this also works for Asian books, so this may be slightly out of scope for the European Time Machine project, but you can also show that this works for Bamboo Scrolls. They essentially have the same problems. And here we did a test where we essentially virtually cleaned a bamboo scroll from you know the earth and dust and rubble that it's typically contained in. We essentially do that by tracking the individual bamboo slips. This then results in tracked slips like the reconstruction shown here in this image. And once you did that, then you can relocate it in the image and remove all the rubble and the dust. And once you have cleaned the volume virtually, then you can also virtually unroll the scroll. And here you see the image of a photograph on the left hand side and the extracted information from the CT scan on the right hand side. So really impressive results and we can use this on bamboo scrolls, we can use it on various types of documents and we hope that with these techniques we will be able to access more of our past. Il y a cette idée d'être capable de, de, de fournir à l'utilisateur final des moyens complètement innovants de naviguer évidemment spatialement, euh, même si ce n'est pas aussi évident que ça encore aujourd'hui, mais aussi de pouvoir naviguer euh, temporellement. The past thus becomes an invaluable resource to develop new tools of knowledge, an essential testing ground to train algorithms and consolidate progress in artificial intelligence. The time machine will also provide Europe with a unique ability to preserve endangered heritage. I want to show another project that is done by my colleague Vincent Christlein. He has been using also deep learning techniques in order to identify writers. And here you see a contemporary example. The idea is that you have some query, you have a database of writers and you want to find the most similar writer to the query or you can even retrieve a number of writers that were most similar. And of course, this can also then be applied to historical texts. The historical texts may not have a clear reference of the author, but still the similarity analysis is very useful because we can essentially do a cluster analysis and figure out how many people have been involved in the creation of this document. And we also can cross check one writer against other documents, whether the same writer appears again. And this can help us, for example, for analyzing the structure of different writing agencies of the past. The main idea of the algorithm is essentially to sample from the data, then extract features, and they could be classical features or features returned by deep learning. This ends up then with some local descriptors. They are encoded into a global descriptor. And later we use this global descriptor in order to match the correct writer. Now, we've seen over the past, Vincent did quite a bit of progress. And of course, the deep learning techniques turned out to be the most powerful over the last couple of years. Well, is the problem solved? No, there are still quite a few issues. So for example, binarization is a problem for writer identification. Sometimes in historical documents, we don't know whether the reference is correct. So here we have two examples that show the same ID, but they seem to be different scribes. One reason in this case could be that those two samples have been taken at very different positions in time, which means that the scribe could also have undergone changes in his handwriting, which makes it really difficult for us to do the correct classification. And if we want to resolve things like that, we might also need time dependent models of our scribes. Handwriting may change over time. It's also an interesting idea to think about how much of the handwriting is actually inherited. So is the handwriting of people that are related by blood similar? So there are many, many interesting problems that can be investigated here. By the way, an interesting side effect is that with the methods that we use for writer identification, we can then also generate text. And Vincent just had a very nice paper about generating handwriting and not just generating the text itself, but also the brush strokes. So you can see this can also be done completely automatically using techniques from generative adversarial modeling. Il doit y avoir une prise de conscience sur le patrimoine qui doit au moins être comparable avec ce qui est en train de se passer sur la chute de la biodiversité animale. Quand un site 
disparaît. Ce sont des pans entiers de connaissances que nous ne pourrons plus jamais utiliser pour comprendre le présent et anticiper le futur. Preserving the past in order to withstand the test of time, but also to cope with the worrisome trends in living conditions on Earth and respond to the wayward ideology affecting our times. Notre rôle, c'est vraiment construire et mettre à disposition cette base de données, cette encyclopédie, exactement dans le même esprit que les encyclopédistes de, de la période des Lumières qui voulaient compiler des connaissances. Ben, on cherche à, à, à compiler dans ce nouveau matériau qui est le matériau numérique, euh, cette richesse culturelle, cette richesse sédimentaire qui décrit notre passé. Well, what else do we have? Text recognition is of course a huge problem if you want to make any meaning out of the scanned documents. We have to be able to recognize the text in there and to detect entities. So text recognition is a challenge also in printed books because they have been using many, many different types So type recognition is a problem that Matthias Soré is working on. So you can see him on the top left here. He's working with this type repetitorium. And with that, he then extracted many different types. So here are examples for the Roman types, the Gothic types, even more Gothic types, and even other types like Hebrew and Greek writing. And now the key idea is if you had a working type recognition, you can automatically detect what kind of text recognition engine you need to process this text. And this way you can then build specialized models that have optimal performance with respect to text recognition in that particular type. You can use, of course, deep learning here. He is using this convolutional feedforward model. It's an adaptation of ResNet. And turns out that it does very good classification on page level. And now the interesting part is that you cannot just use this for page classification, but you can also use it to localize if you have different types on a single page. And this is actually the case in this example here. You can see the top and the bottom is in Antiqua but the center is using an italic type. And we can use this type recognition trained on pages, but also localize within the page. You can also use it for clustering. Here is an example where we clustered pages of known type and we color code the type in the respective color here. And obviously you can also put this to use in pages where we are not aware of the correct type. And then we looked into the different pages and could find out that the clusters really represent the different types. The race for the digitization of our past will not only be run by representatives of our public and scientific institutions. There is still a risk of seeing our history privatized, which raises the question of our society's ability to tackle such an issue. You can argue that Google can do that better than anyone else, right? Uh, they have the best algorithms around. Uh, and I still think that it's crucial for Europe to you know, do that on our own terms. If you imagine that uh, an algorithm will only crawl those aspects of our cultural heritage that it finds most relevant to its advertisers, uh, you only get a very partial uh, idea of what the truth is. I want to highlight one more project at this point, and this is a project by Aline Sindel. So she is in a cooperation with the German National Museum in Nuremberg and we're looking into depictions of Martin Luther here and we want to help to create a critical catalog of all of those images already at that time and in particular because Martin Luther was a very well-known person these portraits, paintings and prints were extremely popular so they started essentially something like a serial mass production of those paintings and we try to build automatic methods in order to link different artists, different images, and also different contexts of Martin Luther with each other. So you can see that this then involves partially image registration between portraits and portraits, but also between prints and prints. And then 
You can also do multimodal. So let's say you have an infrared image and a photograph and you want to align those two. Then you use methods of image registration and in particular challenging are the mixed type methods where Aline also has a very nice contribution that is essentially extracting the brush strokes that a human painter would do when trying to copy that image. And this can be applied to prints and it can also be applied to portraits, which then allows us to do a cross-modal mixed type registration. Also image analysis is very interesting. There's repeating elements and you can see that people have been using templates in order to speed up the mass production. And this way we can then find different elements of different images across different images using those similarity analysis methods. And we can help to figure out whether the same template was used in its image or not. A last question that we're also looking into is repeating motives. And here, of course, the key challenge is to abstract from the actual image to the motive and really pinpointing it to a certain situation or a particular depiction of Martin Luther throughout his lifetime. Well, let's look into the portrait registration. And I have a very nice result here from Aline where she was using essentially biometric approaches. And the idea here is that she's using a facial recognition that is able to detect the eyes, nose and mouth. And then we're using this biometric landmarks in order to do the cross modal portrait alignment. And this turns out to be working really well. So I have a small animation here where we are showing this blend between the one image to the other and you can see that we get really appealing registration results here. Of course also the registration of prints is very challenging and in particular the prints may have a very similar appearance but what you're actually interested in are the small details. So you want to figure out whether the same printing template was used or whether different templates have been used, but dependent on the pressure and the wetness of the ink, the two prints may have very different appearance. You can see it here in the left and the center image. They have probably been produced from the same template, but different amounts of pressure have been applied. And therefore you see that the appearance is very different. Still, if we use point like features, we can match the different parts of the image and then register the two. So you see here on the right hand side then a fusion and you see that both of these images overlap really well. And if you have this registration, you can now use it to analyze the tiny differences between the images. Let's say you have a wooden template that is being used for this printing process with these registration techniques, then you can find tiny differences and you also want to automatically highlight where things are missing. Could it have been the same template? Is there just a small piece of wood missing that broke off during the production process? Or is it entirely new template such that we can't get a general very good match? Well, so these are all very interesting questions. And if we were able to find these small differences in the templates over time, then we could probably also figure out the sequence of production. You know, if there's something missing in a print, it's likely that a part of the template broke off. And this has to be missing in all subsequent prints. Interesting and very challenging projects. This is an issue of culture identity, politics, economics, and ecology. 
the Time Machine Consortium must convince European society to share in this project. L'Europe est à un moment clé de son histoire et elle doit décider qu'est-ce qui est le plus important en termes d'investissement. Un des enjeux de Time Machine, c'est donner une possibilité d'ensemble négocier une histoire commune pour envisager et co-construire un futur. I hope I could convince you that the European Time Machine project is a very exciting project. And of course, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Instagram, you can go to our website. And by the way, we are still actively seeking for new members. So if you got interested by this presentation, approach me or approach others. And we are happy to tell you how you can become a member of the European Time Machine project. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And if you have any questions, you've just seen that you can reach me on Twitter, you can send me emails, and I would be happy to take your questions in a following discussion. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye.